Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the 19th Annual Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum. We are so glad to have you with us here this morning. And to start off our first panel, to kick off the nine panels that we will have today, uh, where we will hear from all of our exhibitors and special guests, and so that we hope you will stay with us throughout the day, as well as, a, uh, as, well as attend all of the booths in the adjoining caucus room and see all of the technologies that are on exhibit there and talk to all of the exhibitors. Uh, we hope this is a great day, a chance to really learn and uh, have a chance to have dialogue with many, many fascinating people, learn a lot, and hopefully we can all uh, gain a lot and help move our country forward uh, for a clean energy economy. So to start off this panel, which we are calling Setting the Stage, uh, we will first hear from Scott Sklar, who is the steering committee chair for the Sustainable Energy Coalition. And let me introduce myself also before Scott uh, starts. Uh, I am Carol Werner. I am the executive director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute and also serve on the steering committee of the Sustainable Energy Coalition with Scott. And of course, it's the Sustainable Energy Coalition that is sponsoring this expo and forum today with the Senate and and House Renewable and Efficiency Caucuses. Scott. Thank you, Carol. Mitzi, could you pass that out for me, please? Um, I want to start saying that my, um, my company blends all the clean energy and energy efficiency technologies all over the world. I have projects on every continent, including Antarctica. Um, and I teach two interdisciplinary courses at the George Washington University on sustainable energy. So I come here every year for the last 19 years, uh, being grayer and losing a little more hair. But I, uh, my job is to sort of say, tell you what happened since last year. So the year 2015, we have the stats now. At the end of 2015, obviously, it takes a few months to get them. Uh, UNEP, United Nations Environmental Program, uh, with Bloomberg New Energy Finance, said that renewable energy broke the 156 gigawatt barrier, meaning 156 gigawatts, or essentially 156 nuclear power plants worth of renewable energy was added to the global grid. This is the first time ever we have broken 150 gigawatts. That's huge. When I started in this field uh, 40 years ago, uh, it was a half a gigawatt. So to be at 150 gigawatts, is astounding. 2015 was the first time we, uh, we broke $150 billion of private sector investment globally in renewable energy. $156 billion has been put in by the private sector. If you look at countries, they put in almost $800 billion, a little over that actually. So we've had almost a trillion dollars worth of investment, but it's the private sector investment I want you to really spend, uh, to think about. Uh, 2015 was the first time that half, more than half, of all new power generation added on this planet was from renewable energy. In fact, 253 gigawatts added of, of, of all power 130 gigawatts from renewables, excluding large hydro. And then after that, coal capacity, 42 gigawatts, oil and gas, 40 gigawatts, and nuclear, 15 gigawatts. So renewables is huge globally in what we call in electric additions to the grid, all right? Uh, all clean energy investment, um, Okay, um, I'm talking about, in this case, a subset of, of uh, private sector investment, venture capital, public markets, distributed financing, and a asset finance in 2015 exceeded $285 billion. So that's a subset of traditional financing. And last year, this past year, 2015, the first time in history and by the way, I'm going to tell you something. When I started in this field, 
everybody told me, you know, you can never have an industrialized country totally on renewable energy. The grids just can't handle it. Now, of course, they were only talking about solar and wind, and I want to remind you that geothermal, biomass power, hydro and marine, and waste heat and cogeneration are 24-hour power, okay, as is concentrated solar power. But they're only talking about wind and solar when they talk about renewables. You could never have an entire grid on renewable energy. Well, on Sunday, May 8, 2016, all right, this year, in Germany, the fifth largest economy in the world, all right, 90% of the country's total power came from solar, wind, hydropower, and biomass. How astounding is that? When I used to say that 40 years ago, people would laugh at me up here. Uh, and I worked in the Senate here in the 70s, would laugh at me that that would ever happen. And here it is in my lifetime. So the, well, maybe. But the papers I've handed out to you that I teach at my GW classes, if you take these studies in aggregate, what they come to the conclusion is that with technology we have today and the resources we have on this planet today, we can meet most or all of our global or U.S. energy needs with a combination, and I stress a combination, of high value energy efficiency, energy storage, and the complete portfolio of renewable energy. That's what you have that I, that I handed out to you today. So I want you to think about that. And the people at this table uh, will give you more detail and vision on this, but the point being is we are on a trajectory that is as important as the trajectory of communications Distributed communications, by the way, that's what cellular is, um, and, and seamless grids, uh, self-healing grids, with cellular and the internet in, in energy. That's what this transformation is about. So thank you for hearing me. I'm going to have to leave because I am in the big room uh, introducing other speakers. But thank you for coming. And happy if any of you, after you go through this today, please feel free to stop by and talk. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. And, and who better to hear from next in terms of setting the stage for the big picture is Roland Risser, who is the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Renewable Power at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the U.S. Department of Energy. Delighted to have you with us, Roland. Thanks. Thanks, and I'm happy to be here with you today. I'd love to talk about the PERE, the acronym for Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy, so you'll hear me say PERE, uh, shorter, uh, about their program. You probably know that DOE is the federal agency primarily focused on the next generation of clean energy, and that's why it's important that we have a strong role in this, specifically for the renewable power programs. And those for us are wind, water, solar, and geothermal. We're continuously assessing the potential for renewable power in the United States. This includes identifying critical research, looking at development, demonstration, and deployment activities to help move this technology forward. To give you an idea of the size of our program, I'm going to talk about our budget request. So a budget request is very different from budget, but the budget request into FY17. So our largest, for the total of renewable, is about $550 million. For the largest program is solar. It's at 240 million. Wind is the second largest at 145. Geothermal is 97. And water, which is a, a growing program, is at 69 million. So while our work primarily focuses on research and development, many of the challenges to deploying this renewable resource involve uh, way beyond technology solutions. You have to have market solutions and, and address market barriers. So I'm going to spend some of my time talking about that. So within our programs, we work to address these market barriers to deploying renewable power at commercial scale. And they include both technology and non-technology costs, and includes things like reliable, objective, quantitative information to inform decision making. So how do we do this? Well, we work with a broad set of stakeholders to quantify the resource potential and to figure out how to remove those barriers to that potential 
And those include things like environmental impacts, regulatory issues, human use conflicts, and access to financing for renewable power technologies, all in line with the national energy policies and our department goals. In solar, for example, we've made incredible progress over the years. You've heard from Sklar about that, that about two thirds of the remaining cost reduction that we're addressing is not on the technology itself, but it's on the, what we call the soft costs. And these are things like permitting and interconnection to the grid. An example of how we're dealing with soft costs includes a project called the National Community Solar Partnership, which really is looking to unlock potential for solar power to those who normally would not have access to it. This is our uh, households and business businesses that are renters, they don't have adequate roof space, and uh, low and moderate income folks that don't have the capital to invest in this upfront. So we're working with uh, stakeholders in the public and private sectors to expand things like community solar. And this allows low and moderate income households in particular a pathway to get DOE expertise and national lab expertise to implement uh, programs and projects. This partnership is uh, collaborative between DOE, HUD, the uh, EPA, USDA, and then key representatives from the solar industry, NGOs, and then state and community leaders. So it's a broad brush approach. An early technology example of how we are strategically focused both on the R&D and in reducing market barriers is in the water uh, technology program office. So while we're not only focusing on R&D, such as funding innovative wave energy devices, we're also investing in addressing environmental uh, siting issues, regulatory issues, financing barriers to allow these to be commercialized. This is particularly important in, like in wave energy or current energy where we don't have a history of uh, putting these in place so there's, you don't have a history of how to get the permits done and working with the Department of Interior and others. Another more advanced industry example in the water power office is conventional hydropower. We don't, haven't talked a lot about that in the past, but you have to understand this industry has been around for 100 years. And the, it out currently uh, provides about 7% of the renewable power to the US. This is a pretty big number. Electric, electricity storage, which is a critical element for renewable power, which you heard from Sklar, is such as pump storage is a key element to getting even more renewable power onto the grid. The market barriers in this industry are well known, but there are still significant challenges to reaching the increase in hydropower in the U.S. We are currently working on a hydropower vision report, similar to a wind vision report we released last year that analyzes the potential for hydropower in the United States. Again, this is both uh, hydropower on the land and then hydropower on the ocean, which is called marine hydrokinetics. And this involves both technology advancements and environmental sustainability. We also have a vision report coming out on our geothermal uh, program called Geovision. And you might have heard of our Sunset 2020 report, which now we're working on our Sunset 2030 report, which is where we're going with solar for 2030. So even assessing in resource potential can be risky and costly. For example, in geothermal, we initiated a program called the Play Fairway Analysis in 2014. Now, Play Fairway, that's not a golf game. This is a term that is brought from the oil and gas industry where they look at information that's available on what's the, the surface and subsurface data that lets them know where, to, where the highest potential locations are to then go out and do your exploration and your drilling. The costs are in that drilling phase. You want to make sure you have the best locations to do that. And we would, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about grid modernization. This is the only way for us to reach the full potential of renewable power. We recognize that the grid we have today does not have the attributes necessary to meet the demands of the 21st century and beyond, including renewable, a significant renewable penetration. The current business as usual trajectory for the electric industry will not result in the timely uh, transition to a modernized grid. Innovation in the electricity sector is, is inhibited by regulatory, market, and business model uncertainties. A lot of uncertainty is there and people don't know where to go next and how to move forward. Moreover, large investments that we do today won't be fully in 
instituted for, for years, and then they'll be in place for decades after that. So everyone's very careful about what investment they're gonna make. Our nation is ready to make investment decisions that will create the grid of the future. The federal government recognizes that it is a public good issue, and that the federal sector is a unique position to help the transition for states, industry, and other stakeholders. Through the, the department's grid modernization initiative, we've mapped out a multi-year plan to lead to a coordinated portfolio of activities to help the nation on a cost-effective path for a resilient, secure, sustainable, and reliable grid that is flexible enough to provide for the array of emerging services that remain affordable to, to consumers. These aren't new problems. However, our offices are trying to think differently about how to solve them. At ERE, we're continuously striving to get the right balance between technology and market issues. We focus on solutions that have widespread relevance and where the industry is unlikely to invest on its own. Thank you very much. Thanks, Roland. It, it and, and I just want to encourage you all to follow up with Roland or with other EERE staff in the other room later because there are so many, golly, gee whiz kinds of stories coming out of EERE in terms of technology advancements, let alone this longer term work that is critical to, to being done. So now we're going to turn to Dr. Deborah Stein, who is the professor of the Practice Engineering and Public Policy Department, and she is also the Associate Director for Policy Outreach at the Carnegie Mellon Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. And how she gets that on one card beats me. <laughs> Deborah, thank you for being here. <laughs> yeah, hi, uh, thank you very much. It's great to be uh, in UC. And I should say that uh, I used to work on Capitol Hill. I worked for Congressional Research Service for so many years. So some of you come across my reports, I finally went up here. Um, and I was also the White House. I was Executive Director of PCAS. So I was the President of Council of Advisors Science and Technology. So I've been in academia for only about four years now, uh, and so therefore you'll find that I'm not uh, a sort of traditional um, academic, and so I'm going to start out with this question. So one thing I have uh, learned in my teaching days is it's best to ask a question rather than provide an answer. So you're the policymaker, and you're trying to, if you really care about electric vehicles, okay? So, and you care about, and your ultimate goal is to you know, reduce emissions uh, from, no vehicles. So the question is, does it matter where your policy goes? Should it be just a nationwide policy? Or should it be a policy that maybe varies based on region? So let's say how many of you would say, okay, let's go for a nationwide policy, electric vehicles everywhere, wonderful thing. Okay, a few of you. How many of you think it depends on where that electric vehicle is? Okay, well good, we have our right answer. And the, the answer for that is, as many of you know probably, is because it depends on where your electricity comes from. Uh, if you're in Pennsylvania, like I am in Pittsburgh, then the majority of our uh, energy comes from coal. And so that means that an electric vehicle uh, that's in Pittsburgh is not necessarily going to get you the best benefit uh, compared to one that is in California, for example, where there's a lot more reliance on renewable energy. Well, but let's take uh, another example. If you're looking at, uh, say, wind turbines or solar farms, where are they better located? Are they better located in Pittsburgh? Or are they better located in the sunny southwest? How many think Pittsburgh? And how many of you, if, you know, it's overcast, how many think Pittsburgh? Okay, how many of you think the southwest? Okay, the correct answer is Pittsburgh. And the reason why is because, you know, we, and we've done a study, this is a study, it's in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, and you find you'll get more air pollution benefits uh, for the same reason, by having your solar plant or in Pennsylvania, Ohio, West Virginia, which are all coal-based states, than in California. So I have come to the conclusion that all um, energy policy is local. And I worked with the national government for many years. I was here for like 20, 30 years. And the more I work at the local level, the more I realize that there's a lot that needs to be uh, understood at that level to really have an ultimate long-term impact on the environment. So here's another question for you. Uh, data centers, you guys know about data centers? Do they use a lot of energy, or have they been increasing over time, or have they been decreasing over time, or have they remained the same? So how many think data centers, uh, their energy use has been increasing uh, as, as the, you know, our uh, reliance on IT has increased? Increasing in energy consumption? No? 
not decreasing. Can you not, you got, you got, you know, like my students, you got to answer the question. Thank you. How many do you think it's the same? Okay, a lot of uncertainty here. The correct answer, we just came out with a study that says that actually the energy use from data centers has remained relatively constant in the past couple of years. Uh, I think I have questions right at the end, so. Uh, I just wasn't clear if you're talking aggregate or center. Uh, aggregate. Oh, okay. Yes, yes, exactly, aggregate. Uh, so, these are some of the other ideas. Now, another, uh, I was actually just in Paris at some meetings uh, that were uh, focusing on European energy policy. And the focus there was on energy storage, or one of the panels that was doing energy storage. And they were talking uh, primarily about what kind of energy storage. Anybody want to take a guess? Lithium ion is the correct answer. And, uh, but here at Carnegie Mellon, we have a company that's called Acreon. Uh, it is an aqueous hybrid battery, basically a salt water battery, that is low cost, uh, that ha has gone from laboratory to manufacturing and job creation, all within about 10 years. Um, and it provides the ability to provide uh, renewable electricity for the grid, um, and energy storage for the grid so we can have more renewable electricity. Uh, but I often find that people just continue to talk about lithium ion batteries and don't look at the other options um, that are available. The other thing we do at Carnegie Mellon is we run a, a clean tech enterprise competition sponsored by EERE. We're one of eight national regions that cover four states, um, Ohio, uh, West Virginia, uh, Ohio, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, and Maryland. Uh, and uh, I was just at our national competition, as well local competition. Our, one of our student teams last year won the national prize, and it was for a hybrid truck. And rather than focusing on the cab, as you might think, instead it focuses on the trailer. So as the trailer goes downhill, it gathers energy, and it goes uphill, it uses energy just gathered by it. And now Pittsburgh have a lot of hills, so that works out pretty well. Uh, the team that I work with this year uh, is called Gecko Robotics. It won the Rice competition that it's at Rice University. And what it is, it's a robot that climbs up inside the boilers uh, that can be cold. Uh, boilers, uh, boilers for cola, for example, and it detects when there's faults. And so right now about 40 people die every year from doing these inspections, um, and the a robot does better detection at lower cost, and then people can just come in and, and fix, you know, wherever those detectors are, and that increases the energy efficiency. I should say, by the way, the Highland, that was coming much earlier, that increases truck energy efficiency by 30%, uh, this increases the efficiency of, say, coal uh, facilities by about 3%. So we have a lot of um, technologies that are on the market that we're really trying to uh, push into the, the, uh, the marketplace. Now, the challenge we have is uh, what are called non-market factors. I talked a little bit about this last year when I was here. Um, so non-market factors, so, you know, a, a technology can work and a technology can have a market. I'd like to use an example of the autonomous car. Uh, but there can be non-market factors, and non-market factors are those that are policies that either encourage or discourage that technology in the market. Like part of the reason, for, I think, that um, Appion, that's a salt-water-based battery, has been successful is because of the pull, technology pull in California, of requiring energy storage by 2020. Uh, but we, uh, my class every year, we take two or three cases on of real-life examples uh, in, the, uh, in the region, uh, where there are what I call unintentional non-market factors that are making it more challenging for technologies to reach the marketplace. Uh, one example of this is we have a company that is buying these trucks, um, and they have difficulty because they produce the fuel, uh, but somebody else does the trucks, and so as a fuel company, they can't, uh, they have no control of the truck regulations, so they have to work with the uh, uh, partners. Uh, there's a hydropower company, uh, that is trying to take existing uh, dams that are owned by the U.S. Congress and are sort of falling apart, it wants to renovate them and make money from them. Uh, everybody's in favor of it, including our report, but nobody can seem to figure out from a congressional standpoint how to fix the legislation so that it can occur to make money um, so that that investment makes sense. So these are the types of things that uh, we work on at, at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, we just try to encourage better decision making and, and food analysis, answering the questions we might have from the policy perspective. Thanks. Terrific. Thanks, Deborah. Really appreciate it. So we will now turn to Nicole Steele, who is the executive director with Grid Alternatives, which is bringing another aspect to thinking about a diverse economy in terms of looking at equity and solar.
Nicole, thank you. Thank you, Carol. Um, again, my name is Nicole Steele. I'm the executive director of Grid Alternatives Mid-Atlantic. Um, it is our vision to make clean, renewable energy accessible to everyone. And so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Grid Alternatives, we are a nonprofit solar installer, soup to nuts, um, full service, uh, and we are, but we work exclusively in low-income communities, and we use a job training model to do the installations themselves. So I spoke on a panel here this time last year, and we were very, very new in the D.C. region, and I think we probably had done about 10 single-family installations at that time, and I'm happy to report since then we have provided over 200 kilowatts of free solar to homeowners in both D.C. and Baltimore in the past year. So we're very proud to be able to continue that service, but, you know, we have to have good local, state, and federal policies to make that happen. So again, the, for those of you who are unfamiliar of the story of GRID, we started out in California about a decade ago um, in Oakland by two uh, engineers that were seeing that solar was only accessible to sort of like wealthier individuals. And so there's this huge market of people that are disproportionately impacted by their utility bills, but yet they don't have the access to the benefits of solar. At the same time, the state of California was creating um, the SASH program and the MASH program. And so GRID became the administrator of the SASH program, which is the single family solar affordable housing program. It's a rebate program that we administer. And because of that, we became incredibly successful across the state. And we have about 10 offices across the state of California that's been implementing low income solar um, with job trainees for about the last 10 years. Um, and we've also been able to expand into the MASH program as well, which is the multifamily side of things. Um, and that's a program that's fully funded through their new cap and trade program. So it'll be interesting to see how the funding continues to flow through that program. But we have been able to expand our offices in the state of California, um, double and triple in size because of that funding that's being, that's being directed into that program because it is so important to make sure that low income individuals do have access to clean energy um, and also those jobs that come along with it. So about five years ago, we started to open offices outside of the state of California and as you know, um, most states don't have SASH and MASH programs. Uh, so uh, all of our affiliate offices look very, very different from one another based on policies that are on the ground. So our first affiliate office in, California, or in Colorado, outside of California, um, was opened because it had a great renewable portfolio standard and we were going to be able to leverage the SRECs and we were very excited about entering into that market. Well, as soon as we did that, the SREC market tanked um, and we had to figure out a whole nother approach to bringing solar to low income communities um, in the state of Colorado. Fortunately, Colorado was one of the first states to adopt um, or implement community solar on a larger scale and also required a low to moderate income carve out. Um, so we've become one of the larger developers in the state of Colorado to provide 100% um, uh, solar to the LMI community in Colorado. And we were, we did open the first 100% um, LMI community solar array in the country in partnership with Grand Valley Power, which is a rural electric cooperative in the state of Colorado about a year and a half ago. And since then, we have now developed a pipeline of 2.9 megawatts of community solar that will come online over the next two years in Colorado. And uh, yeah, so that's a huge win in Colorado, and that'll continue to move forward rapidly. Um, and then we opened an office in New York about a year after the Colorado office. And as you know, New York is going to look very different from Colorado and, uh, and California. And so we have a great partnership with NYSERDA. Um, we have some on-bill um, uh, pilot programming happening in the ComEd territory. Uh, we're about to launch a really great uh, partnership with the Connecticut Green Bank and their multifamily program in the fall. Um, and then there's an SREC market that can be leveraged in New Jersey. Um, so they're, they're a strong uh, a market, um, but with lots of different types of um, both state and local level programming happening. And then we move down to my office. So we're physically located here in Washington, D.C., but we cover D.C., Maryland, Delaware, and Virginia. And we talk a little bit about the Carolinas and West Virginia and Pennsylvania. Um, as you know, all of those areas are very different from one another, but we have been able to be incredibly successful in D.C. because there is a Solar for All program 
um, through their DC Sustainable Energy Utility, which provides a rebate for single-family low-income homeowners. Um, as you may know, DC has the best SREC market in the country. Um, in um, two weeks ago, I think it was, the, the DC City Council passed a 50% RPS standard, um, which is incredible, and um, all of the alternative compliance payments that will be coming through that program will go towards low-income solar. So it is definitely the vision of DC City Council and the mayor to make sure that solar is accessible to everyone, and that is was unlocked through very specific local policies. And DC is a very specific or um, special circumstance because it acts like a city-state. Um, Maryland's a little bit different. We've been very active in the city of Baltimore and Maryland had a pretty good SREC market and we were able to leverage that and we have third party um, financers that we can leverage the federal income tax credit because one of the things, um, you know, I've, talk, I've been talking a lot about state and local incentives, but you know, the ITC is a huge solar incentive. However, the community that we serve does not have access to federal income tax credits because they don't have that same tax liability um, that other individuals would have. And so we, as a nonprofit, also don't have a tax liability, so we have to find partners to, to leverage that. So that's one of the things that we're always like, you know, that, that's a great policy, it's a great incentive, but it's actually not accessible to everyone. And our whole vision is to make sure that this clean energy economy, this growing economy, is accessible to everyone. So I've talked a little bit about how we've been able to open our offices and how we've functioned in these different areas, but I haven't really talked about um, the job component and why that's so important. And so we have an initiative called RISE, which is Realizing an Inclusive Solar Economy, um, where we target the communities that we work with um, and we work directly with job training organizations to get individuals on the roof that may not otherwise even know what solar is. Um, and these are good, well-paying, not only jobs, but careers. And so we can provide that opportunity for an individual to get up on the roof and they don't even have to have ever used a hammer before. We'll teach them everything about the solar installation process um, and really take them through so that they can demonstrate competency in all the bits and pieces of that process and to connect them to the, the growing solar industry. So you might know that the solar industry is growing 12 times faster than the rest of the US economy. And being located here in the Mid-Atlantic, the uh, stat that came out of the Solar Foundation's jobs report uh, earlier this year was that 90% of uh, employers in the Mid-Atlantic think it's either somewhat or very difficult to hire qualified employees in the Mid-Atlantic. And so that's why it's so important to be able to connect individuals to this job and provide that opportunity for job training. So I just want to close by saying, you know, we are a nonprofit, um, and so we don't want to see ourselves as an industry competitor. And so a lot of people think of us as, you know, well, you're a solar contractor. How does it work? And it's like, well, we work in an area that the industry is may, may not go themselves, and we are continuously evolving and flexible to make sure that we're providing that value add and filling that gap within the industry. And so when we recognize that there are gaps in the industry, that's where we will be nimble and fall into place to make sure that we're helping create good local, state, and federal policies to really fill those niches. And thank you. Thank you.